Monsieur de Lafayette, having received the account of the criminal attempt of the 20th of June, wanted to lead his army to Paris to protect the king against the Republicans. But he soon discovered that all feeling of love and even of interest for the fate of the monarch was extinguished in the hearts of his soldiers. A king seemed to now to be a thing superfluous or out of place in the Constitution. The army was in the enemy's presence. Its chief desire was to wash off the disgrace of its first defeats and to lay by victory the foundation of national independence. Monsieur de Lafayette had the noble courage to attempt alone what he could not obtain with his army. He came to Paris, appeared at the bar of the assembly, complained with energy of the insults the king had suffered, of the acknowledged plan of destroying the Constitution, and of the anarchy with which France was threatened. This noble step, although supported by the minority of the assembly, did not succeed, and Lafayette was on the point of being impeached from thence. He went to the palace of the Tuileries, where he was received with coolness. Instead of appearing grateful for this act of fidelity, the prejudices of the royal family were so strong that it is said the queen declared she would prefer dying to being served by such an enemy. The general left Paris sorely grieved for the fate of his king and country. He was soon followed by the emissaries of the municipality and a few days later, his return to the camp. He was obliged to fly to a foreign country for refuge, but instead of finding that refuge, he was in violation of all the laws of nations, made a prisoner in the dungeons of Austria. The enterprise of Monsieur de Lafayette, notwithstanding, its ill success made the Jacobins sensible that they had not a moment to lose for the accomplishment of their plans. The court was upon its guard. It was no longer possible to attempt assassination. An attack by open force was in consequence resolved and fixed on for the 4th of August. But whether the conspirators were not yet ready or whether that day had only been named to deceive the court, the attack did not take place then. Monsieur de Verdier, passed all day at the palace, and on returning in the evening, he used to make me share his fears without being able to inspire me with his hopes. He told me that emissaries were dispersed through all the suburbs and even in the club of the Jacobins itself, that all their designs were known, that the National Guards were commanded by Monsieur Mandar, a late officer of the Guards Francaise that on the first order he might give 20,000 citizens would rise in arms, that all the loyal nobility and citizens of Paris would go to the palace, that the king would mount his horse, and that the day intended for his ruin would be his triumph. I did all I could con to convince him that the National Guards would not march, that they had lost all confidence in their own power, that they were divided in their opinions, and above all discouraged, in one word, that they were afraid of the Jacobins. I observed that Monsieur Mandart was scarcely known and inspired no confidence, that three or four battalions of gallant men would be insufficient to repulse the aggressors who were the whole populace of Paris, that the Swiss guards were objects of horror and would be overpowered by the irritated people, that it would therefore be wiser to make use of the protection of these troops for the purpose of leaving Paris and retiring toward Normandy, where a numerous body of cavalry might join the court. I insisted chiefly on the necessity of leaving the Tuileries in the night, the Swiss being masters of the post at the turning bridge that communicated with the Place Louis XV. The first hours of the retreat would pass off tranquilly, but it was impossible to make Verdier listen to reason. He continually referred to the marks of courage and loyalty exhibited in petitions signed by 220,000 citizens who every day and on every occasion openly declared their love for their king and their implacable hatred of the rebels. These are only signs manual, I said. The citizens will fly on the firing of the first cannon. You do not know what it is to hear women lament and children cry. The good people will retire to their beds and weep. 
I was unable to convince him, and he was a faithful echo of all those who surrounded the royal family. However, this noble old man behaved very gallantly. He escaped by a miracle the massacre at the palace, went to Koblenz, and having returned to Paris a short time afterwards, he perished on the scaffold. The 10th of August was at last decidedly fixed upon by the conspirators. The battalion of Saint Antoine, in which I served, was not decided to take any share in the day, although it was commanded by a staunch royalist. But my company of chasseurs was under the orders of a young architect named Blev, a man of determined spirit and one in whom we place entire confidence. He sent us word at two o'clock in the morning. The greatest part of the company joined him, and at four, we set off for the Tuileries. A dismal sight presented itself to us in the way. Numerous groups of common people, armed with sabers, pikes, and pistols, crossed the Rue Saint-Antoine, going toward the suburb, and casting threatening looks, as if they were surprised to see us march another way. Some of them abused us. Others called us their neighbors. The women were at the windows or in the streets, embracing with tears their husbands and sons. The gloomy energy of these men was depicted in their countenances and motions. As we advanced, the deepest silence reigned on the quay. Daylight seemed to recoil before the sacrilegious spectacle of a city abandoned to all the horrors of civil war and crime. We arrived in the court of the Tuileries a little before five o'clock. At that time, the palace had not the imposing aspect which now renders it one of the most noble royal residences. The large court, separated in all its length from the square by an iron railing, was divided in three parts, each encumbered by houses and walls. Instead of the railing, there were old decayed buildings occupied by tradespeople, and the grand entrance closed with a folding door. A short while after we'd arrived in the middle court, a company of artillery of the sections of the Blanc Monteau entered with two field pieces, crying, Viva le Roi. The battalions of the Petit Pair and the Fille Saint Thomas had preceded us and were drawn up in line of battle in the court. We soon joined together, interchanging the most touching tokens of friendship for one another, attachment to the king, and hatred of the rebels. At five o'clock, we learned that the king was going to review us. He soon appeared, accompanied by a few officers of his household and about 20 persons in plain dresses, armed with pistols and muskets. His cold tranquility and apathy under such terrible circumstances produced a painful impression. He addressed to us as he was passing by a few words we did not hear and returned to the palace. This scene made a dismal impression on us, but it was quickly dissipated when the grenadiers of the battalion of the Fils Saint Thomas proposed to us to sign a proclamation in favor of the king written by one of their officers. We went into a room on the ground floor, which has since served as antechamber for the home department of the Council of State. The gallant author of the proclamation had been wounded a few days before by the Marseillais in Champs-Élysées and had been carried to the Tuileries in a hand barrow. We had the pleasure of embracing him. I suspect he must have perished a few hours afterwards, and I am sorry. I do not re recollect his name. The emissaries we sent to the Faubourg Saint Antoine came every now and then to tell us that the enemy was setting out and would soon arrive. We were fully determined to repulse him. Nevertheless, our unbounded devotedness to the royal cause could alone make us blind to the smallness of our numbers and our desperate situation. I can affirm that there were no more than 300 men in the chief court and none at all either in the Pavillon de Flore or in the Pavillon Marsan. The Swiss occupied all the apartments of the palace and, to crown the whole, with a general-in-chief of our well-disposed army was Monsieur de Wittinghoff, an old man above 60 who spoke barbarous French, knew nothing either of France or Paris, was rather lame, and certainly had not the least idea of the enemies he had to oppose or the position he had to defend. In fact, if the Jacobins themselves had arranged the order of our defense and chosen our general, they could not have done better for their own interest. On the approach of the enemy, 
the king resolved to seek refuge in the legislative assembly. A grenadier of the National Guards informed us that he had carried the Prince Royal in his arms on the terrace of the Foyon and described all the insults the royal family had endured from the populace who already filled that part of the garden. A little while afterwards, Monsieur Baudrillard, syntic or president of the directory of the Department of the Seine, came to us and desired us in the name of law not to attack, but to repel force by force. This was no doubt very prudent on his part, but what were we to defend? Was it the palace and its furniture? Or did not the king, by leaving his residence and going to the assembly, seem to declare that he surrendered himself up to the assembly, which was now the sovereign authority, and whence we were to receive our orders? The king's retreat and the speech of Monsieur Roderer spread discouragement and confusion among the National Guards. The cannoneers of the battalion of Blanc Monteau threw down their matches, stamped upon them, and said there was nothing more to be done, there being no king to defend. During the scene, I was on duty at the gate of the court, facing a Swiss, an absolute machine, with whom it was impossible to exchange a word, but an aide-de-camp of General Wittinghoff passed near me. I asked him what his general intended doing. He shrugged up his shoulders and said, I do not think he knows himself, but I believe we are in an awkward situation. We have to fight the Marseillais. I know the people of Provence, and if the plan is to spare them, we are lost. He had scarcely spoken when howlings gave us notice of the enemy's approach, and the doors soon gave way to the repeated blows of the thick beams with which they struck them. All the guards that were in the court dispersed, and I followed gravely my Swiss companion, who, according to the orders he had received, returned at a slow pace to the palace. And we entered together the saloon of the guards. The Swiss were ranged on the two sides of the great staircase and in all the apartments facing the windows, three in depth. The officers were trying to stimulate them, but their faltering voices betrayed their consternation. I had expected to find National Guards in the palace. Surprised to see nothing but foreigners, I was uncertain as to the manner I should act when a Swiss officer, taking me by the arm, begged me to accompany him to the garden where his company was stationed. My regimentals were a sort of protection. We went down together to the first landing place, facing the door that leads to the old chamber of the Council of State. There we found the great staircase, barred by a beam and defended by several Swiss officers who were politely disputing the way with about 50 men whose dress made them look like robbers in a melodrama. They were intoxicated, and their coarse accent betrayed their origin. They came from Marseille. The officer repeatedly told them that the royal family were gone to the assembly and that there was nobody in the palace and that the Swiss had received a positive order to defend its entrance. But reason was of no avail with them. We will enter. We will examine all the apartments was their only answer mingled with cries of Viva la Nation. The soldiers, by command of the officers, returned in bad French the same cries and raised their hats on their bayonets. At last, the conspirators succeeded. The barrier gave way to their efforts. They forced their passage, and we seized the opportunity to go down. We were still in the vestibule when a well-directed fire began from the apartments, and almost at the same time, the cannon were heard. I am convinced that the Swiss fired first. My memory has never for a moment deceived me in respect to that circumstance. It is, however, useless to discuss the point, for it is certain that the conspirators came with a view to attack the king. If the Swiss began the fire, it must have been because the court had hopes of gaining the victory. But in that case, the Swiss ought to have gone down or rather to have marched against the enemy and have attacked him in the streets before he had time to draw up in the square. It seems that the plan was to attack the enemy's flank, as some Swiss posted in the court of Marsan made a sortie and even took two field pieces, but they were repulsed. The first discharges from the palace had killed or wounded a great many, and the principal court 
had been quickly evacuated, but the cannonade brought disorder and consternation into the ranks of the Swiss. They abandoned the windows. The enemy advanced with renewed courage, crossed the court, and rushed into the apartments. The unfortunate Swiss were unable to defend themselves any longer. The most horrible massacre began and terminated only when the last of them fell. They were pursued from chamber to chamber, the most obscure corner, the most solitary cabinets. Even the chimneys into which some had crept could not save them. They were thrown out of the windows and their bodies were stripped and exposed to the barbarous derision of women of the lowest class. As those of the murdered Protestants after St. Bartholomew were subjected to the indecent railleries of the ladies of the court, Two hours sufficed to exterminate 1,200 warlike and well-disciplined soldiers commanded by brave and devoted officers. Three or 400 noblemen stationed in the apartments that joined the Pavillon de Flore and who were undoubtedly designed to attack the enemy's flank had the good luck to escape through the gallery of the Louvre. They had been hoping for a triumph in the result of the battle. A battle it really was and ability as well as courage ensured the success of the revolution party. The manner in which the royal troops were disposed was, as I mentioned above, quite contrary to common sense. The throne and the existence of the royal family were at stake, and they were trusted to an old courlandeur in the service of France and to Swiss soldiers. In such a populous metropolis, where so many brave men might have come to assist the monarch, he was left with only 400 defenders. The king might at least have stimulated his troops by his presence and his courage, instead of which he left them in the decisive moment to seek refuge among his most inveterate enemies. On the part of the conspirators, the plan for the attack had been well combined. The vanguard was composed of Marseillais and enthusiasts who feared no danger and looked upon death as a glorious martyrdom. The army was protected by 50 cannons well served and had determined chiefs. Among these were principally distinguished an Alsatian named Vesterman, who acquired a great name in the War of the Vendée afterwards, and Ragovsky, a Polish refugee, a well-informed man and tutor to the son of one of the first noblemen of France. Forced to leave his country after having fought for his liberty, he'd carried to his new home all the hatred he entertained for the treachery of his sovereign. Louis the Sixteenth appeared to him as guilty as Poniatowski, and he seemed on the 10th of August inspired with a wish to avenge the indifference which the cabinet of Versailles had shown to Poland at the time of her first misfortunes. He was killed at the head of the column he commanded. Cannonballs fell on all sides in the garden of the Tuileries. I sought refuge in the legislative body. What a scene did I witness there. The king and his family were crowded into a reporter's box near the president. The king remained motionless and affected the air of an indifferent spectator. The queen softly pressed her children to her bosom and seemed from time to time to wipe away her tears with her handkerchief. In the hall, some persons showed marks of fear, while others took pains to disguise their fury and their satisfaction, all betrayed an agitation and anxiety that did not allow them to remain in their places. The debates continued, however, with an appearance of order on subjects foreign to the terrible tragedy that was acting. Victory was at last announced by the conquerors themselves, bearing into the hall the spoil of the palace and proclaiming the massacre of the vanquished amidst furious cries of the nation forever, death to all traitors. The king had been obliged in the beginning of the contest to sign an order forbidding the advance of the Swiss battalion at Corbevoia, and it is a circumstance worthy of remark that the court being resolved to defend itself did not call in that battalion during the night.